Welcome back. And uh, so I've had this idea in my mind since they came out with the format and they announced, all right, we're going to come back and we're going to play hockey and here's how we're going to do it. So on the left are all the top seeds that are playing against uh, the seeds on the right. And here's how they win and here's how they lose. I am not making predictions now because we don't know who's going to play. We don't know health of the players. We don't know any of this yet. For instance, there could be any number of players that say, you know what? Uh, it's not worth the risk to me, so I'm not going to play. And we don't know what the reasons might be. Might be somebody in their family, might be themselves, whichever it is. Um, you know, it's it's too far out right now for me to say, all right, well, if everybody plays, which then that, that may change as we get closer. So that being said, let's get into it. And I'm going to do the top seed and the lower seed and how they win or how they lose. And this is, I've always enjoyed this kind of comparison uh, there are annuals that have done this, how they make the playoffs, how they miss the playoffs, how they win the cup, how they don't win the cup. So we're going to go through this, and I tried not to repeat myself as much as possible. All right, Pittsburgh. Uh, how they win? Well, if Malkin's healthy and playing like Evgeny Malkin can, it's going to be really hard to stop them. Sidney Crosby has to be healthy as well. They need both, in all honesty. They need both to be healthy, and they need a Matt Murray bounce back. I know Jari's been the better of the two goaltenders, but... In big games in a series like this, they're going to need Matt Murray. Uh, and John Marino needs to show that there's no intimidation factor for him when it comes to playing these big games. He needs to continue to show that next level because their blue line, well, let's let's look at the, the red, red writing where it's how they lose. Uh, if the goalies struggle. So if we see like Jari in game one and he gets pulled and then in game two, Murray doesn't seem to be quite with it. Remember, this is a best of five. Any kind of struggle by the goaltenders in Pittsburgh could be done before we reach the official playoffs. Jake Gensel, not 100%. One thing for Pittsburgh is if Gensel plays and he's 100% and you can move Zucker around that, I mean, their, their winger, wingers suddenly are no longer a weakness. And so if Gensel's not quite 100%, that could throw things off. Gensel was playing very, very well before he got hurt. And the defense. The defense, if the defense lets down, if we see some kind of setbacks on that blue line, uh, Montreal can absolutely steal that series. So how does Montreal win the series? Carey Price. If Carey Price plays like the 2015 Carey Price, then they can win it. Now, the other thing is Domi has to play. And I'll circle back on Domi in a bit because he may not. But if Domi plays, that's going to help. He has to bounce back from what was kind of a subpar season compared to the year before. Uh, and Jonathan Drouin needs to play, be healthy. If they have Drouin out there, they can throw a little bit more offense on the ice. That'll help. And then Romanov. I've got up there with a question mark because does Romanov play? Is the NHL going to let him play? Big question right there. And the answer could be a huge difference between whether or not the Montreal Canadiens are in and, and they move on or if they're out and Pittsburgh moves on. Now, the, the ways that they lose this series, allowing two-on-ones. Allowing two-on-ones was absolutely killer to them during the year. And when Carey Price's numbers weren't great, you could look and say, you know what, yeah, Carey Price allowed a goal there, maybe he shouldn't have, but they need to stop allowing so many two-on-ones. If they do that against Pittsburgh, they're dead. Uh, Domi, if Domi doesn't play, that's going to put a hole in their lineup. It is hard to replace him. And it is quite possible that due to being diabetic, he says, I'm, I'm not playing. And I don't think anybody will hold it against him if he says that. Uh, Nick Foligno says he hopes that there aren't any players that are uh, construed in a, in a negative light because they decide not to play for safety reasons. I don't think that'll, that'll be a problem either. I don't think there'll be any kind of daggers thrown at these players that decide not to play. But Domi may be one of the ones who says, I'm, I'm not going to. And then if they can't contain Sidney Crosby, Montreal could be done quickly. Uh, this could be a three-game three game scenario uh, with three in a row for, for Pittsburgh if they can't contain Sidney Crosby. And Crosby's going to be itching to play some hockey by the time we reach these eliminations. So, for that series, that's how that goes. Carolina. Uh, Sveshnikov needs to be at the next level for them to win. Um, they need their, their defense to be healthy as well, looking at Dougie Hamilton with that. And Mrazek needs to be able to stop guys like uh, Mika Zibanejad and uh, Panera, Panarin as well. Uh, the the real big question is whether or not they can slow down the bread man and, and Mika Zibanejad. Uh, that's the question mark. And I have Mrazek up there because if it's Reimer starting, that's a whole other problem in and of itself. 
And where how they lose? Shaky net. So if we do see Mrazek go in and then Reimer goes in and neither of them are, are locking down the net. Again, it's a best of five. You can only lose three games. Uh, the young core, if it struggles, if it finds himself, uh, let's say, coming out of game one, they lose game one, four nothing, something along those lines, uh, it could snowball quickly over a five-game series. And there isn't a game seven in this. So for Williams, no game seven. Uh, no game seven magic. I guess you can qualify game seven or game five as the game seven, but it's not really game seven. On the Rangers side, Mika needs to pick up where he left off. So Mika Zibanejad needs to pick up where he left off. And D'Angelo needs to keep it up as well. D'Angelo had a great run going on at the time when this break took place. And Shesterkin kind of needs to be the starter. I love Georgiev. And it would be great to see Henrik Lundqvist win a Stanley Cup as a starting goaltender. But let's be honest, the New York Rangers with Shesterkin in that were really, really hard to beat. And so he needs to be the starter and he needs to assert himself right away. Um, if they can't contain the Canes, that's how they lose. So if the young forwards for the Canes manage to break through early on the Rangers, uh, Carolina can take take over and change the narrative quickly. And the narrative is part of the problem for the Rangers. They can't buy their own hype. Look no further than last year's Tampa Bay Lightning, who Columbus is dead, came out in the first, first game and were kind of lackadaisical and didn't really pick it up until it was too late. So that's a problem. They, they can't be buying their own hype on that. Uh, and if if the kids struggle. So if if guys like Fox uh, struggle, if Shesterkin struggles in the net, if they're good young core, they're good young players that are going to replace some of the older players, if those guys struggle, then the Canes absolutely can win that series. Islanders. They need the trap to hold, but they also need the goaltenders to hold. So the Islanders all year have been playing kind of a trap style of game. But they usually allow, usually allow more shots than they take, which is kind of the setup, but they need for the goaltenders to hold and continue to play really, really well. So Grace needs to be as as good as he was before the break. Uh, Barzell really needs to come through. Barzell needs to show uh, that, that level of, of not just the talent that I saw the last game they played here in Vancouver, but he needs to be able to break through and get those goals. And they need three scoring lines. If they're going to beat the Florida Panthers, they need to show they have multiple scoring threats. And they need to be able to, to exploit any kind of weaknesses with Florida's defense. Now, where they could lose it is if they're struggling to score. The trap doesn't work very much if your team can't score enough to overcome any of the, the, the deficiencies you may have against Florida. And then with that, I also have included they, they need to be able to contain Barkov. Yes, Huberto was their number one scorer this year, but it is Barkov. If Barkov is not under control, if Barkov is allowed to kind of run roughshod over the New York Islanders, then the Islanders don't, in my eyes, they don't have much chance. If Barkov is the MVP of the series, Florida should win. But on the Florida side, they need Bobrovsky to take over. Bobrovsky hasn't really been what was expected when they signed him to all that money. So he needs to take over. And their offense needs to be able to overcome the trap. They need to be able to exploit any weakness they can find on the Islanders' blue line and do it regularly. And they also need, in my eyes, Howell and Walmart, who had mixed reviews after getting there, they need those guys to click. So if Howell can throw in a goal here and there and Walmart can throw in a goal here and there, again, it's a five-game series. They only need to come up big a couple of times and the Florida Panthers could knock the New York Islanders out of the playoffs. Now, where they can lose the series is if the defense becomes an issue. You can look at Bobrovsky's numbers and say his numbers are bad because he hasn't been very good. Or you can look at the blue line and say, well, it's the blue line that needs to be better. Ekblad and Yandel defensively have been a misadventure. Both of those statements, absolutely true. I think you can make the argument that it could be 50-50 between Bobrovsky and the blue line in front of him. Now, if the trap throws them off, so if the Islanders play a trapping style and it's a one nothing game, it's 2-1, to one, and Florida can't get any flow going, they have to make sure they don't get irritated and start getting frustrated with it. That'll lead to penalties, and that'll lead to Florida power plays, or that'll lead to uh, Islander power plays, which could be lethal. Um, and if, if Bobrovsky's safe percentage is below 900 on the series, I don't see how they win it. Even with the scoring, I don't see how they win it. If Bobrovsky's save percentage is below 900, he needs to be at at least average level in order for their offense to be able to get things done. Toronto. 
Uh, they need the 47 goal Matthews to show up. This needs to be the year where Austin Matthews proves he is the man. He needs to silence all the critics now. Uh, I understand he's young, he's got a lot of years left, but he needs to silence them now with this play-in. And Freddie Anderson needs to play well, too. I love Freddie Anderson, and he had one really nice run there with the Anaheim Ducks before he came, became a member of Toronto. I know he can do it. I know he can be one of the best goaltenders in the league, and he needs to show that. And Tyson Berry needs to buy in. If Tyson Berry is kind of wishy-washy, or if he's not playing the way he was under the new coach, if he's not playing the way he was there... And instead of the Sheldon Keefe version, you get more of the Mike Babcock version, they're in trouble. Because on the negative side, if their defense crumbles, which we've seen against Boston year after year, which says a lot as well about Boston's talent, not as much about Toronto's lack of talent in my eyes. And without Jake Gardner, they don't have their, their um, scapegoat this year. So if the defense crumbles again, who's going to be the scapegoat? It could be Nylander. And Nylander's not a blue liner, but he does have defensive gaffes here and there and sometimes gaffes at the other end. If Nylander has a big gaff in this series, a big, ah, uh, crap moment, then Columbus could beat him. Columbus could knock him out. If, if that happens, it could throw everything off. And then injuries could become an issue if Columbus plays big, heavy hockey. And considering these teams will still be relatively... I mean, they'll be in shape. They'll still have had the full training camp and everything. But, it, you know, is it full game shape? Where are they at? If they're not ready to play that physical game that Columbus can play, then they could be facing injuries early against the Columbus Blue Jackets. But let's talk about Columbus because that's where things get interesting. Uh, Seth Jones has to play. If Columbus has any chance against Toronto, Seth Jones has to play. They are a completely different team with Jones in the lineup than they are when he's not. And their forwards need to be healthy. It's a pretty good forward crew for Columbus. It's just everybody was hurt. And as soon as guys like Stenland and Gerby were, you know, getting prominent roles, as hard of workers as they were, it was saying a lot about just how many injuries Columbus was dealing with. And their starters need to steal games. They need, whether it's whether it's Corpusala, whether it's Merzlikens, whoever ends up being the starter in this series needs to be able to at least steal a game and make it so that Toronto is on their heels. If they can steal game one, they only need two more. And then you just need a big play from Seth Jones. You need a couple of big plays from a forward, looking at Cam Atkinson with that. And then you just never know. Maybe a big goal by Nick Foligno. Now, where things can go bad, they've got a jinx this year with injuries, right? Would anybody be surprised if coming out of game one, we saw three injuries to Columbus players? I wouldn't be surprised. I'm kind of going to be more surprised if there are no injuries to Columbus players at all. And so they, they need to overcome this jinx they've been dealing with all season. And they, they, if they can't slow the Leafs down, so if that attack gets going, and if the big four for Toronto is able to score even just two or three goals in any given game, it's going to be really difficult for them to, to win the series. Because, again, it's a best of five. And uh, if the scoring does, in fact, dry up. If Anderson plays well, and if their scoring dries up, it could lead to a lot of frustration quickly. And I could have put in there as well, and I'll mention this now, it's not on the board, but if Tortorella loses his temper and loses his cool and becomes a bit of a distraction for his team. It's all, it's out there. Even though he has changed his style, I'm going to say it here because you just never know. Going out west. So that's the Eastern Conference. Now we're going out west. McDavid and Dreisaitl will decide whether or not the Oilers move on. Right? McDavid and Dreisaitl need to be on separate lines and then they play together on the power play. As long as both lines are going... I don't think Chicago stops them. They could also benefit from the James Neal that they had in October. In October, James Neal was fantastic, and then he kind of dried up after that. And Koskinen, I think, needs to be the starter. Nothing against Smith, but I think Koskinen needs to be the starter. And I think he needs to, to be the kind of goaltender he was when they were playing well. Koskinen's had a pretty good year. Now, on the negative side, if experience becomes a disadvantage, if Chicago's experience, if they come in, they have a cool head, and, and they're able to outweigh an, an, an impatient Oilers team, that could be a benefit to Chicago and lead to an upset, especially if Cassian loses it. So the second point is Cassian. What could Zach Cassian, who's been sitting around waiting to go out and play hockey since March, look like in August, right? That's five months off. In, what could Cassian be like? How easily could members of the Chicago Blackhawks get under his skin? Because that's going to be a game plan. Get under Cassian's skin and throw him off. And goalie uncertainty. Should Koskinen have any kind of struggle and they're going back and forth, 
Five game series. That could be it. Chicago. Kane, Taves, and Keith. The three of them have had time off. Rest is important for veteran players. And for Duncan Keith, you have to look at this and say, hey, this is a chance. This is a chance that we probably shouldn't have had. And so we can go out and take advantage of it. And maybe those older players can find the fountain of youth, right? Uh, not that not that Kane and, and, and Taves are that old, but Keith is, is getting up there. So Crawford also being rested, I think, is important. And with them having traded off Leonard at the deadline, you know, now they have Subban as the backup, they really want to make sure Crawford is able to play potentially five games in this series and play well. And maybe him being rested helps. And Debrinkit needs to be able to redeem himself. Debrinkit did not have a good season. I think he would admit that. If he can go out and play really well and give the Oilers a lot to worry about, and if he and Strom can find some of the chemistry they had last year in this year's play-in round, they can score the upset. So how do they lose it? If the core shows its age, if the younger Oilers core is able to start pushing their way through on Chicago's. Now, it's not going to happen to Patrick Kane. I'm not going to pretend that's going to happen to Kane. But it could happen with Keith, and it could potentially happen with Taves as well. Uh, Taves has had you know a, a pretty good year. But could I see the Oilers going in there and, and maybe being able to throw him off? Yes. Have Taves take penalties? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Taves is, is a guy who complains when he takes penalties. He really throw him off his game. So uh, if that core shows its age, the Oilers could take him out in three. And if Crawford has any kind of shaky starts, that's going to that's gonna do it. Uh, they, they have to. I can't see Subban coming in and stealing a series against the Oilers. Uh, and the other thing that's a factor in this is Chicago sold at the deadline. They sold Leonard. They sold Gustafson. They were like, "All right, we're gonna sell. We're done. We're just we're gonna we're gonna stockpile some draft picks and prospects and go back next year." Now they have a chance. But does losing that depth at the deadline does that make it harder for them now against the Edmonton Oilers in this play-in round? All right, moving on to Nashville. Nashville, Yossi. Roman Yossi, who made a, a really strong case for himself for the Norris Trophy in the second half of the season, and really, in all honesty, probably, I think, one of the best all-around defensemen in the league. I have he, Victor Hedman, uh, as probably the top two guys. I know that's open for debate. There's lots of guys you can throw in there. Seth Jones comes to mind, but for me, Yossi's just that good that he can take over a series. They need Duchesne to bounce back. Duchesne has not played great hockey as a member of the Nashville Predators, and he admits he can be better, and he needs to be better. So this is a good time. Johansson having a bounce back from what's been a subpar season would help as well. And hoping that maybe the time off helps Pekka Rene. Yes, Soros was the starter as we went into the break. But if Rene comes in and he wins that job back in training camp, and if if he shows you know a real bump from this time off, sort of like Crawford for Chicago here, who knows? Anything's possible. Uh, now, what could could off their chances are if Saros and Rene have issues. So if, if Saros loses a game one and then you have to go to Rene in game two, you can only lose two games from there. And if Rene isn't quite up to, that's the thing. If, if these goaltenders aren't quite up to, up to par. And then the other thing is scoring. It's a simple thing, but if their scoring dries up, it's the advantage to me that they have on Nashville or on, on Arizona is that Nashville has the guys who can score goals. We know they can. Not necessarily having great years this year, but we know they can. Kyle Turris. We know Turris can score at the NHL level. It's just a matter of being able to do that in this series against Arizona. And if their power play struggles. If their power play becomes an issue, remember the penalty kill for Arizona, known for being pretty good. And they're also known for their shorthanded goals. So if their power play struggles, that could lead to shorthanded goals as they try to force plays through, which would favor Arizona. So how does Arizona win? They need playoff Phil Kessel. Regular season Phil Kessel this year wasn't very good. So they need the other Phil Kessel, the good one. Uh, Connor Garland, they need him to come through and score some goals. They need big goals. They need a guy who can score them. And I think Garland is their best bet going into the playoffs. Probably one of the best kept secrets out of Arizona. We'll see how that goes for him. And they need Darcy Kemper to steal it too. Uh, Kemper is, is a fantastic goaltender who, of course, got hurt. Ronta went in. Ronta pretty good as well. But they, they need... Uh, Darcy Kemper to be the starter. And they need him to steal at least a game against Nashville, put him on their heels. Uh, now, where they could fall apart is if the scoring continues to be their issue. If after game one or game two we're saying 
this Arizona team just can't get a goal when they need it, they're going out and Nashville's moving on. And if Kessel from the regular season shows up in this in this play-in round, that's going to be a problem. And if Taylor Hall is not a factor. Taylor Hall needs to look at this as a chance for a redemption. The Arizona Coyotes did not look like they were going to make the playoffs, so the fact that they're in this play-in round to decide whether or not they actually do make the playoffs is important. And so Hall needs to be a positive factor. If he's not a factor or if he's a negative factor, I don't see Arizona having much chance. And then what that does is it drives down the, the price of, of Taylor Hall's next contract. It has to, right? Okay, Vancouver. So on the Vancouver side of things, um, Markstrom has to be the king of, of the net again. Markstrom absolutely has to play the way he was playing before he got hurt. Absolutely great game. And, you know, all this talk about how he should have some, some consideration for Vesna, I think it's warranted. But again... Um, I just say that as somebody that admits I'm a Vancouver fan, but I've also been very hard on Vancouver's goaltending over the years. Markstrom was great this year. And they need Pedersen to shine. They need Pedersen to make, take that next step as a superstar. He's a very good player. He is, he is that star player that Vancouver needs to lead this next generation of Canucks. And he, he needs to do that. And then they need Quinn Hughes to play like a veteran. Not get rattled, not have Minnesota throwing him off of his game. Make smart plays. Don't get forced into moving the puck if you're not comfortable with it. That kind of thing. And just just play smart hockey. And as long as Markstrom, Patterson, Hughes, these are your three guys. I could have thrown Besser on the board or Horvat, But let's be honest. It's going to be Markstrom, Patterson, and Hughes that are going to decide whether or not Vancouver moves on to the actual round of 16. Now, in experience is where things could be a problem. Markstrom has never played a game in the playoffs. So since this is a playoff atmosphere, we'll see what he's made of. And the inexperience of Patterson, Hughes, and many others. Horvat's never had a playoff game either. That could be very telling. Uh, and if they struggle defensively. So during the year, I took some heat. I'm fine with that for talking about how Vancouver won games they shouldn't have. Defensively, they were terrible, but Markstrom bailed them out. If they struggle defensively against Minnesota, they put more pressure on Markstrom. That could definitely lead to Minnesota victories. And if Demko's in the net for Vancouver, I think that's probably game over for Vancouver this year. I, I can't see them winning the series if Demko ends up being the starter for some reason. Whether it's a Markstrom injury or Markstrom doesn't play well in a game and they throw in Demko. If Demko's in the net to start a game, Vancouver's in trouble. On the Minnesota side, they need beast mode, beast mode Kevin Fiala. I don't know where this Kevin Fiala came from. I don't know if it's sustainable. I don't know if he can do it again next year. But with the amount of time that they've had off, it's kind of like next season anyways, isn't it? And so he needs to rediscover the beast mode that he's had for that team. Uh, and their goaltending needs to hold. Uh, Minnesota fans, rightfully, probably very concerned about goaltending in this. Staylock needs to play very well. And Dubnik's already made, sort. he's already hinted that he may not play, depending on what the situation is for how they're going to make this work. If he doesn't like the situation, he's fine with staying home. And so if, if they have to go to Staylock, if Kakonen's going to be the backup, how does that work out? And Galchenyuk I have with a question mark, because to me, he's one of the ultimate wild cards. Did not put up a ton of points after getting to Minnesota, after not putting up a ton of points in Pittsburgh. And that's after being traded out of Arizona, which was after he was traded out of Montreal. Galchenyuk is a UFA this summer. Maybe he comes through and has a really big five-game series against Vancouver, understanding he's a UFA and he's playing for next year and he's playing to try to justify making decent money. And so I think Galchenyuk and, and the Canucks' ability to hold him, off, hold him off. Worst case scenario, Galchenyuk has an amazing best of five series against Vancouver. And so Jim Benning looks at him and goes, I'll give him whatever he wants this summer. That would be the worst case scenario. Absolutely the worst case scenario. That the Canucks fall out of this and that Galchenyuk then goes to Vancouver for like five, six million dollars. So if they, they get the allowance to, to buy out Erickson and then they use that money on Galchenyuk probably be the most Canuck thing they could do. Now, how they don't win the series, Minnesota, would be if they can't beat Markstrom. So get frustrated by Markstrom early and often, that'll that'll probably do it for them. If the trap doesn't hold, Minnesota's probably going to play some form of the trap against Vancouver, try to keep chances down. Boring hockey, however you want to call it. The more exciting the game is, the less likely it is Minnesota wins it. And if the veterans wear down. There's a lot of veterans in this lineup. How does the time off affect them? And then 
once they get back into the action, how quickly do they wear down? If the veterans wear down for Minnesota, that would lead to a Vancouver victory. Last series, promise. Calgary, they need Johnny Hockey to be a superstar. Johnny Hockey has to be a superstar. And it's really important because if he's not, if they play like, let's say they go out in four against Winnipeg and jo Johnny Goudreau has like one assist or one goal and one assist in four games, there's going to be a lot of talk about trading him. And at that point, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how long that goes on before it actually becomes a thing. Giordano needs to shine, needs to realize this might be his last chance at a, a nice long run for his career. Uh, and Riddick needs to measure up. Riddick needs to be the guy. Talbot had some good good games this year, absolutely, but Riddick needs to be the starter. Uh, in the, the simulation we just had for NHL 20 here, uh, the Flames ended up winning the Stanley Cup, and Riddick was the Conn Smythe winner. So, hey. Uh, and on the negative side, if the first line struggles, they're done. The, if the first line struggles, Calgary's not moving on. Uh, and if, if their depth has struggles, uh, that also is going to do them in. And, you know, you've got Lucic, you've got Reader, you've got some guys there that are should be looking for redemption and should be looking for, you know, a, a new narrative for themselves. Lucic trying to justify his contract somehow. And so if that depth struggles, that's going to hurt them because they're against a team that's very deep. And scoring on Hellebuck sucks. It just does. I didn't know any other, any other way to write it. This year, Hellebuck's been great. So we'll transition over to Winnipeg. And now Winnipeg wins. They have enviable forward depth. When Harkins came up this year, I was like, well, all right, Harkins, he makes it. He looks pretty good. And anywhere up and down the line, he looks pretty good. This is how they lost Brandon Tanev, and they're fine. Because they still have other forwards to come in. They have really good depth up front. It is kind of fun to watch. And Hellebuck needs to be Vesna level. Calgary's going to bring it. And this should be a very wide open, fun series. And... Hellebuck needs to be that Vesna level goaltender. And their defense needs to show that the regular season wasn't some sort of fluke and needs to prove that they can still play that way in the playoffs, or in this case, a play-in series to get to the playoffs. And so that's what has to happen. We need to see the defense hold up and, and you know, uh, see if that's the case. Because on the negative side of things, if they can't contain the first line, they're done. If Lindholm, Monaghan, Goudreau comes out and plays like they did last year in the regular season, Winnipeg's in trouble. And then if their defense does get exposed, and, and this would be obviously related, if Calgary's offense gets things going and Winnipeg's defense looks like kind of a mess coming out of game one, in a five-game series, it's really hard to bounce back. Just throwing that out there. Uh, and again, you know, Calgary does have the higher seed. We'll see how... How the NHL makes the seeds matter. Because since it's going to be a negative neutral site territory, how is it going to matter? How does that, how does it work? How does it even matter? Um, and then the other thing for me is if Line A struggles. So Line A had a very good year this year. If Line A struggles out of the gate, and especially if Line A struggles and if he seems kind of mopey about it or upset about it, and if, if that becomes a distraction, that's something that I think could cost Winnipeg as well. So there you go. That's as close to predicting all of these series as I'm going to get for quite a while yet. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. How do you think teams win or lose each series? Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support, and do hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happened upon this video. I will talk to you again soon.